Hello and welcome to Conversations from the ANF podcast. In this episode, we speak to foster carer Matilda, who shares her experience of fostering and some of the challenges her family faced. After fostering a child short term, they moved to a permanent arrangement. Matilda shares their story of the impact of an allegation on that arrangement, the child and her family. It's a story that's not uncommon and Matilda's story shines a light on what is a significant challenge within fostering. As always, if you have experience of adoption, fostering or special guardianship from any perspective, personal or professional, and would like to share that on the podcast, please get in touch through the Facebook or Twitter page or you can email us at andfpodcast at gmail.com. If you could just let us know a little bit about yourself and tell us about what, how you and why you became a foster carer. Okay, um, my husband comes from a family that used to foster, um, so I kind of knew about it a bit like that. I think it was after I'd had my child, I really enjoyed being a mum, and I went back to work as a probation officer, but only did it, I t- did three days a week, but I was finding it quite stressful working three days a week, and I just kept exploring the idea oh, I'd like to do, you know, what um, my husband's parents did and fostered and we kept talking it through Um, initially we were going to adopt and then then I realized if I adopted I'd have to go back to the job that I didn't want to do and I thought well (laughs) maybe we could foster so that's the kind of the line we went down Mm. so So if your your own child was quite young then because often people think they sort of often people wait till their children are a bit older so yeah he um he was, pretend we had a, he was just turning, he was four and he was just about to turn five. So he kind of started school. That's our first two foster kids arrived. <laughs> right. So, yeah. How, I mean, as well, I'm intrigued that you're a probation officer, which is not, used, I mean, probation officers and social workers used to be the same people. Um, yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of overlap there, or the historically was. Um, so had that given you sort of an, an insight into the world of sort of children and young people and the challenges they There been? was. One kind of moving story was um, a man who came out and he needed somewhere to live. And he said, oh, I live with my granddad. And he was like, oh, it's not really my granddad. You know, he's my foster dad. But, you know, I call him a granddad because he's a lot older. And they just had, you know, a lovely relationship considering this lad had probably caused him all sorts of trouble, <laughs> you know. <laughs> He was still really open to him coming back and him bringing his little daughter. His little daughter didn't live there, but round. And I just thought that was that was beautiful, you know, that, that fostering doesn't have to have, you know, set endings all the time, that it can just continue like that. That's mm-hmm. really nice. So how did you find the process of being approved? Because people often think it's, you know, there's lots of, you see like fostering in the media and it gives a, like you you know, it can seem quite easy, but actually what was the process like for yourselves? Yeah, it was, yeah, quite long, quite intense. Um, yeah, they kind of go into everything. They contact, you know, people and ask them a lot of questions. I remember a friend kind of phoning me up and saying, oh, I didn't know it would be that full on, <laughs> you know, when I agreed to do this for you and that. So I'm oh, sorry, I, you know, I didn't know what, what they would be asking or wanting either. Um, yeah, I was kind of relieved that I'd had quite a, one main long term relationship because if you'd kind of had lots of, you know, lived with a few people, they have to contact all your ex partners and everything. Yeah. So, yeah, it was quite intense, really. The kind mm. of yeah, the process and then the the training bit that you start with, it, it almost felt like the first few days of training were trying to put you off. <laughs> telling you stories and telling you different things like you sure you want to do this kind of thing but yeah so you were approved what what was your because people again people may not know but you if you're approved you get approved for a sort of a specific sex gender um age yeah type of fostering yeah we were um we approved not to 10 and we could have two children and they said they'd initially give us a bit of respite and one child, but they didn't stick to any of that. <laughs> All right. So what happened then? Tell me about your experience we had, of fostering. Um, we had two children arrive, two children um, who was under one and one was under two, just, just turning two. So, yeah, they, and 
it was they were with us for then kind of 11 months there was kind of no respite it was very here we are here's the kids <laughs> so yeah it was kind of nice I quite liked I think I thought they'd be more involved and I think I quite liked that you know you were kind of left a little bit to your own devices and and things like that you know I got to pick the preschool because they weren't already registered so I could pick the preschool that I knew my son went to and was just down the road and things like that which made life simpler mm. so yeah. and was there a long-term plan for those children or was it kind of was it was it known it, no it wasn't known they, they were exploring either possible adoption or possible um you know going back to mum depending on what happened so yeah and searching I think other family members but yeah in the end they did go on to adoption and we've managed to stay in touch with those two quite not not regularly regularly but enough to know what they're doing and how they're growing up which is lovely <laughs> I mean a lot of foster a lot of um adoptive parents that I speak to and foster care as well to talk about that being quite a difficult experience chatting you know that having strangers in your house or being in strangers houses um you know the whole process of of transition and moving children how did you find that were you prepared for that by you know your social worker um yeah we were prepared of how kind of intense it would be um because they lived kind of on the border of our county so they kind of had to travel quite a bit um but I think the the adoption social worker had really matched the children and in, I think instead of focusing on what their parents were like and things I think they were quite similar to us because I by that point the children had spent kind of 11 months with us so right and so it worked worked quite well really yeah I just remember one time that the little girl jumping on the sofa and it was when we were kind of we had social workers there as well and everyone looking at me and I and they were like do you mind and I said well I don't know who at the moment you know tells her not to do this is it is it me <laughs> is it her mum you know so but yeah and she was so excited she she really wanted mummy and daddy at one point because we weren't allowed you know they weren't allowed to call us mummy I remember her calling me not mummy and I because <laughs> I just didn't realize I must have just said not mummy the little boy called you know my husband's name and I thought oh that's the equivalent if him calling someone dad so it, it really made me think oh he is starting to to get on and settle in but yeah they, they'd done really well they'd done a, a video of their home and sent some teddies in and and you know everything they'd done and my son was quite excited by it he'd watched the video and understood it a lot more than the children asked them lots of questions <laughs> yeah, so yeah I think at one point we had to have a meeting when he was around his granddad's you know <laughs> he didn't take over the whole process <laughs> yeah but it must be having had eleven months with um, two children, and you care for them, you know, as your own, effectively. Mm. It must have been quite a peculiar feeling giving them away to us. This uh, moving them on was it? Was there was there a sense of loss, or was it just like this is my job and it's what I do? No, there was a definite sense of loss. Um, yeah, I think particularly to the to the young boy because he was very clingy. I think. Uh, I think and um, because I could see how well the, the girl had kind of accepted this and realised now I'm like ever, all my other friends at preschool, I've got, you know, mummy and daddy. Um, but, yeah, there's a definite sense of loss. And I think that stays with you. It, it gets much less, but you are kind of always in call, you know, wondered about them and, you know, if they'd stayed with us, even though, you know, that wouldn't be possible. You just kind of think, oh, what would it be like? And so your brain's always kind of there with a little bit of loss, but it, I think because I know they're doing well, that that helps, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's a difficult time. Um, and so then I know you, when we got in touch, you were sort of wanting to talk about a specific aspect of fostering. So um, can you sort of run me through that that story, that nor that narrative? What happened? Yeah, so um, we had a child come, well, she, she came to us on respite and then her placement with her aunt and uncle broke down so she was moving then because we were moving her so she moved with us and by that point she'd been with us only a couple of weeks but she decided she wanted to call us mummy and daddy and because there was no contact with birth family other than an older brother we were allowed to do that and then after a very kind of quite a stressful lockdown with her and having to do a lot of different work with her um 
we decided we'd go to panel and it would be made permanent. And right. I suppose it's just the experience of how quickly permanency can break down. And, you know, mm. I, I, you know, in your head, it's still not adoption, but I think you, you kind of think, oh, you know, it went to court, it took a process, it will take at least a process to break it back down, but it, mm. it, it can just be one person's decision. <laughs> so how old was the young um she came to us at respite and she was six and then she she yeah um she was with us properly when she was seven and then mm. yeah and she stayed with us till she was nine so because permanency is a i mean it's a peculiar sort of like you said it's a it's a it habit a peculiar legal world it's neither this nor that it's it's somewhere in between yeah. isn't it yeah yeah, and, I, and you know, I don't know whether we kind of just missed it. We knew that we were still not legally her parents, but you know, we kind of thought it would take quite a bit to for anyone to kind of say, "All oh, right, okay, you know, that's not working out. We'll move her." Rather than wh- how it happened in the end, it was like on the back of an allegation, and then it was like, "Oh well, whatever happens, she's going." And we were like, "What? You haven't the social work hadn't seen her house, hadn't talked to us, and we weren't." at all treated like family members and maybe we didn't we shouldn't have been and that was the right procedure but for me it felt like you know even in terms of I was really relieved when my social worker said they'd conveyed a little bit about where she might be best placed and suited and it was the same as what I thought like that she'd be better in a family with no other children but I was just like they didn't think to question us about what placement would be good for her or to get her a bit of background from us we were just pushed to the side quite quickly which was upsetting really but, yeah. yeah i mean it's i think permanency is a, is a peculiar thing and, and as i said to you earlier i mean i work with foster carers so that's my sort of bread and butter I and mean, i've been a foster carer um, and i think permanency makes perfect sense this idea that we especially for a child, you know, who's seven, eight years old, to that age to say, actually, well, this is going to be where you're going to stay um, until you, well, in some ways forever, isn't it? Because the, when when they were having the conversation about permanency, what was the expectation in relation to things like, you know, what was there conversations about post-18 as well? We hadn't had conversations about that, but for us, it that's what it meant. It meant, you know, for as, as long as, we're all alive, you're our family. And, you know, that was that, you know, people would, people who needed to know would would know. And obviously my parents would know that, you know, that, that she came to us, how she did, but it would be as long as it needed to be, you know, that she, you know, she didn't have really any other family that were staying in touch. So it would be us and, you know, and her, mm. her, her one of her brothers who was, you know, you know not still a child himself but he wanted to stay in touch and that was all we were going to kind of manage and deal with so yeah and was there any sort of lead up to the allegation i'm i'm, I'm, I'm we're being we're being careful because obviously we, we want to maintain confidentiality for yourself and for you know the child but obviously can you give me any sort of sense of of how that that happened and what happened um uh, They'd been twice before when she'd kind of made allegations, but with a chat with her other social worker who'd known her since she was three and a chat with us. Um, that's as far as it seemed to go. They seemed to, I could kind of say, oh, yeah, there was always some kind of truth in the story. Like I, I grabbed her out of the road. So I was like, yes, I grabbed her. Then my son fell over. So I didn't have time to explain to her, I, this is why I've grabbed you. Mm. So I knew she'd be angry and upset and not really getting what I'd done. So there was always kind of a, something had happened or gone wrong, and then she'd just kind of tag something on to it, you know. So it was quite hard. I remember once um, both me and my husband were in the house, and she was in the garden screaming, get off me, get off me. And I had to say, we're both we're both in the house. We're both together. <laughs> so I don't know which one you think's doing anything, or, you know, we're going to fall out about it. So there was just this, kind of drama that you know and the trauma she'd been through and Mm. the jealousy that she'd have a lot of the time that you know that she couldn't quite cope like if you'd had a really nice day then then 
then she would be have to throw something in at the end or the next day like well I didn't enjoy going to the circus I don't know why you made me go and you just had to say well I I remember your face you know you were happy you were having a great time (laughs) I'll just leave that so and that's probably one of the reasons we didn't adopt is that we were trying to get more support you know for the trauma she'd been through and I was doing play therapy with her um I'd just have at separate times have conversations with a psychologist about how to deliver it and that that was what we were getting because that was all she'd engage in at the time but we were hoping that we'd you know we'd keep getting more support as she got older so yeah it it just I mean it it sounds like you were doing everything you should be doing um and then obviously that's then that turned and when an allegation was taken sort of to the next level was were you sort of part I was speaking to my co-host and we were talking mm. last year, we did a podcast about allegations. It's our most listened to podcast by a third yeah. because it's such a hot potato for so many carers and, you know, and adopters and special guardians. Mm. Um, and so how did that play out? When literally, did you get a phone call? Was it a knock on the door? Yeah, I had a phone call from the school. And then the school asked me to go down, which never still to this day, don't quite understand because then I went down and then I was put in the school office and given another phone call from the social workers in that environment. Um, Yeah. And then I had a a baby in my care at the time. So then we kind of, we got to go home, but, and I could get, got to pick up my son, but obviously the, my daughter is called at the time. She's, she stayed there. Um, I packed stuff. She already had a suitcase packed, which she had said, oh, I'm running away at one point. So I don't know if it was left over from that or that was, you know, I just thought, oh, is that more part of the plan? (laughs) But I know. So we had to pack all her things. I think she managed to make it to gymnastics that night. We were all very shocked, but we, yeah, we, we still thought she'd come home, you know, and it would be quick it took a long time you know and I'm still trying to kind of get to the bottom of of why it took so long they say it was with the police and the police were going to interview you and then in the end I ended up just phoning up all the time until I got to speak to the police person and they said oh no we're not taking any further action and then says I think because she'd come from a different local authority to the one we we lived in I think that they didn't seem to have a protocol of how to deal or who dealt with it you know so it was it made everything a bit more clumsy and slow yeah I mean it's a glib question but I'm going to ask it anyway so forgive me is how how, where was your head in at that moment your you know your husband and your your son as well you must what what were you thinking what were you how were you responding to this sort of out out of the blue Um, well it (laughs) We wanted her old social worker back who knew us, who knew her, who'd supported us quite well um, through kind of lockdown. So we had, you know, she didn't have a social worker at the time, so we had no point of call for her. And as social worker was supportive, but at the same time, not just not knowing anything. So it was just, um, yeah, it no, it was, it was my son went to that school. I think I'd even applied to be a teaching assistant at that school. So you just, you're just like, oh, what will they think? Or what, you know, you just kind of panic. And yeah, I think I went into myself. I didn't know how to, to tell anybody what, what was going on really. Mm. You know, I, I didn't want it to, to be public knowledge because I still assumed she'd come back and, you know, I didn't want people saying, well, how, how can you cope with that? Or, you know, being... Yeah. disrespectful at all to you know to her because she wasn't doing it out of malice she was just you know traumatized and adding you know a couple of lines to, to a story that happened so mm. it was like oh yeah you've you know <laughs> there was again there was some truth to it so I told her a story about um how people used to wash mouths out with soap when they're swearing because she was swearing a lot and I was washing my hands with the soap at the time. She said, don't do it, don't do it. And then she started swearing again. And I put the soap down and I walked. I just left her in the kitchen. And I remember that evening, I always normally reconnect. And we have kind of, request, you know, oh, what well, today wasn't a good day. Let's hope tomorrow's nice. You know, love you. Good night. And because my husband away, I was shattered. 
I, I, you know, I didn't, and she was still kind of yelling and things. We didn't really reconnect. And I think, you know, which was awful, but the next morning she was lovely. So I still had no idea. It was still a bit weird, Mm. but yeah. I mean, I think you demonstrate what I've perceived and, you know, I've been subject to an allegation as a parent as well. And, um, there's this kind of rerunning. What could I have done differently? What? Yeah. What did I say? What didn't I say? And you, and that can be really isolating and very um, just really difficult. Yeah. And no, yeah, no one really would seem to want to talk that through with me because they were like, "Oh, until the police are talked to you, we can't talk about it." And I was like, I wanted to, you know, almost own up to the mistake that I'd made. You know, to say, oh, yeah, look, I held my hands up. I I probably said they used to do this and I probably said it in not a nice voice because you've been, you know, threatening all day or threatening to push me in front of cars on the way home from school. I kind of got to the point, you know, and I know I, you know, I said something horrible, but I didn't do anything. (laughs) But yeah, you couldn't have that discussion with anyone really other than, you know, I think we just kept it between me and partner at the time because... Mm. You know, it is a, an undergoing investigation, and no one wants to, you know, unpick it with you. <laughs> yeah, and, and oftentimes you, you sort of lose perspective as well on, you know, and if it's a, especially words, because the words in of themselves mean one thing, but the, all the intonation, the context, yeah, means everything, doesn't it? That it, without that, the words can be played anywhere that anybody wants. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so did you get any support? I mean, I know that as a foster carer, you're sort of, you've got a legal entitlement to sort of external independent support. Was that made available to you? Um, again, that was difficult because of with the two areas. I had, I know um, Foster and Network were there if if it they'd send someone legally if, you know, it went to the police. But there you know, seemed to be some kind of referral that needed to be filled in by someone if I wanted anything that wasn't the legal. So I was, you know, I knew what to do if the situation, you know, went any further, but it didn't. But I didn't really know, didn't really get much support at the time about just chatting mm. it through or, but there was some person on the end of the phone, but, you know, I don't know, didn't have anyone come or, or a lot of meetings seemed to happen suddenly behind, you know, closed doors rather than, you know, you used to being invited to all meetings about, yeah. your child and then suddenly it's everything's without you <laughs> and so do you were you sort of anticipating that things would you know as much as it was really difficult that things were going to resolve and actually you were going to go back to this sort of promise of permanence that you'd made yes yeah we were we thought she'd come back um we knew she was bullying people at school and and she continued to do so because she went to the same school for a bit and we knew that her best friend or her only friend really from school was moving, not far, but moving schools, which is, you know, quite a big deal for children. Um, But other than that, things were going, you know, okay. She seemed settled. She had lots of clubs and different things she was doing. She, we, you know, we were quite committed to that half an hour play therapy every week. You know, her and my son had, they had lovely moments and great memories and, and things together. So, yeah, we thought it would continue. We'd work out how we'd, what we'd say when we first saw her, how we'd, how we'd try and avoid this happening again, but without making her feel that, you know, she had to say sorry or be, you know, that we're trying to blame her for anything. So, yeah. (laughs) But it didn't, it sort of didn't go that way. Were you sort of notified or were you given and how was that sort of delivered to you? Uh, We were told we had a Zoom call. My husband was in his, workplace at the end of the day and on a zoom call I was at home on a zoom call and our social worker was on the zoom call and so was um, my daughter's social worker and we were we were just told on the zoom call that that was you know that she you know regardless of any outcome she's going to move back to where her birth family are it was said that that's what she said to the social worker but I could never I, I really wanted to kind of have a have the conversation you know know exactly what was said because she's very easy easily led and she could have easily been not told to say that but just made 
made that feel that that's the right thing to say. Yes, I should say I should live near mm. my brother because everybody lives near their brother and she just agree, you know, to it. Or she might think, because every time we did go and see her brother, we had a nice day out somewhere. So she might think, oh, yeah, I'll live near him. I'll yeah. have lots of days out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it was a social worker that didn't know us and didn't know, you know, her at the time either. So I was like, well, how can you make such a big decision? <laughs> yeah. But. You mentioned that you were already, you had, you, at the time of the allegation, you also had another child that you were fostering. What happened? Were they, yeah. did they um, stay with you were, or? No, we were doing introductions with the mum in my house because he was going back to his birth mum. He was an eight month baby and he got taken that evening as well, which, yeah. That, and yeah, that was another thing to deal with because although we, to me, that just went against every attachment theory that I knew because I thought just just literally give him another week or maybe speed things up with mum you know because he's got to meet another carer while he's going through he knew his mum quite well because he had contact four times a week but it was all the difference yeah yeah he went which yeah was another thing you had to deal with because you were you were getting ready to for goodbyes but it was meant to be a happy <laughs> goodbye and in the end it didn't feel like a, a happy goodbye so I mean it's <laughs> it's hard to um sort of listen to and not feel you know he just no one comes out of this well no one comes out of this kind of with a better situation yeah uh, so how do you pick yourself up from that um it was difficult I suppose I had um had my son that helped so you kind of just taking him in and out of school um although that was I stand in a certain place so I could see because my daughter went out a different exit and I could see her leave school every day as well so that was hard um but yeah I just initially I just didn't tell anyone so I could just um, outwardly just mm. carry on with life and and digest but I, th- I think most of the time I still say to people, the baby just went back to his mum. I, I still can't bring myself to say, or oh, they they took the baby at the same time. It, it just, I think because I'm quite angry about that, mm. you know, because I just thought, oh, he had a week to go. You know, <laughs> you, know you, you knew that my daughter can make these allegations. It, it was known. We'd been yeah. quite open about how we'd manage it. And you can physically check a baby and see that there's no injuries and the baby's happy and healthy. So I didn't really get that. So I, yeah, I didn't tell anybody that baby got moved at the same time. I just said, you know, let them have the happy ending in their head that baby's gone back to mum. So, yeah, I think you just, you just continue. I, I think I lost a month really where I was just a robot or upset or, you know, just getting on with some things, watching lots of telly and reading lots of books for kind of just shut it out. Yeah. So, yeah. Because in the midst of all that, the obvious question to me is then, if the concerns were so high, why was your son not taken? Yeah, they interviewed him, but everything took a, took a long time. No one rushed out. <laughs> um, yeah, they did do a welfare interview on him and we had the, the report on him, but yeah. And yeah. Uh, it's yeah, yeah. I don't know to this day if anyone really fully. She never retold the story. You know, she told it very well in school, apparently, and and I get that they had to follow the process, but she never then kind of said it again. Hmm. So yeah, but it sort of had gone too far down the line for it to for them that they felt they could reverse it. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't know whether they always wanted her back in the area where she was born. And um, it definitely made a difference that she had no social worker at the time and then had a new social worker. Hmm. You're going back to panel to be to kind of get your your approval sort of polished and (laughs) signed off again. I'm genuinely amazed that after such what sounds like a traumatic experience that you've you you want to continue fostering? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's slightly addictive. There's something to it. Um, I did have a good experience with the baby until that point. Um, and my daughter, will, although was very challenging, I kind of quite enjoyed 
all the reading, all the work with the psychologist that we did. And, you know, I can see the progress that she made from when she first came with us, you know, even emotional and behavioral, but also educationally and all, all that. And I kind of think, well, okay, this is messed up, but she gets to, she gets to take that with her and she gets to take the memories with her. And I think that's what fostering is about is you make as much impact as you can in the time you've got. And then you just have mm. to, you know, some things are out of your control. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's admirable. I, I guess I've got a couple of questions uh, to finish off with really. One is, um, is there anything you were hoping to say that I haven't asked? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, this, then the last question is, if someone came to you and said, I'm thinking of fostering, what do you say to them? Um, that you, you just, it's a lovely thing to do. Um, you, you'll have your heart broken. Um, I would advise them to read some things about therapeutic parenting and different parenting styles. Um, be prepared to be quite tough with not so much with the children, but with, with nosy people that mean well, but just go, oh, why is your child in care? And what's this and what's that? And you just have to be quite, you know, it's not your business. <laughs> um, but yeah, to, to do it, but to do it with knowing that it's, it's not given as much credit as it deserves as a role really, because it, it is, it's a kind of a profession that takes over your life because you're always reading, you're always trying to find out your, you're a professional kind of parent that's got to fight for this child that no one else really gets. And then someone will suddenly say, well, you know, what do you know? And, and or you might not be invited to a meeting that you thought you'd be crucial at. So it's frustrating, but yeah, there's such, there's really big highs. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that is a great place to finish. I want to thank you so much for um, being so honest with us. And I want to wish you and your family really you know, good fortune, wish you well as you sort of head off back into your fostering career. Thank you. <laughs>